The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche is well known as the philosopher of the tragic view of life. According to this view, human beings are part of a world of becoming, and are constrained by certain limitations that cannot be transcended. Some of these limitations include the realization that absolute knowledge may be impossible, the awareness of ourselves as finite beings subject to time and change, and that life can be full of suffering. For some people, these insights lead to a pessimistic view of life, like they did in Nietzsche's mentor Schopenhauer. But Nietzsche's philosophy shows that the tragic view does not inevitably lead to humorless resignation, like it did with Schopenhauer. In Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy, he argues that the ancient Greeks were able to overcome pessimism through tragic plays, and remain cheerful in the face of their harsh existence. Originally, Nietzsche thought it was the artistic element of tragedy that enabled the Greeks to overcome pessimism. But later, in a new introduction to The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche thinks that comedy and laughter are the real essence of Greek tragedy. Laughter contended for the space that pessimism would otherwise possess in Greek society. Greek tragedy took the sufferings of the god Dionysus as its sole theme, so that Dionysus was the real stage hero of Greek tragedy. All the celebrated figures like Prometheus and Oedipus are mere masks of the original hero Dionysus. Behind all of these masks is one deity, who is the real tragic hero. In tragic poems, Dionysus appears in a variety of forms, behind the mask of a struggling hero, who is entangled within the net of the individual will. He talks and acts so as to resemble a striving and suffering individual. According to Nietzsche, Dionysus is the god that experiences the pain of individuation. This idea is supported by a myth that says Dionysus was torn to pieces by the Titans. Dionysus is a primal unity, but was torn to pieces and became many individuals. And this is the origin of all suffering. The suffering of individuation is the suffering of Dionysus. As Nietzsche writes in The Birth of Tragedy, Thus it is intimated that this dismemberment, the properly Dionysian suffering, is like a transformation into air, water, earth, fire, that we are therefore to regard the state of individuation as the original and primal cause of all suffering, as something objectionable in itself. Dionysus is the god who experiences individuation, which implies a development of self-consciousness and an awakened awareness of one's own will. He becomes conscious of himself as being a unique self. The knowledge of suffering as an intrinsic condition to life is accompanied by an awakened self-consciousness. As Dionysus awakens, gaining self-consciousness, he comes face to face with this fatal truth. In The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche says the truth which Dionysian man has attained is that same truth which Shakespeare's Hamlet possessed. The Dionysian man resembles Hamlet. Both have once truly looked into the essence of things, they have gained knowledge, and nausea inhibits action. For their action could not change anything in the eternal nature of things. They feel it to be ridiculous or humiliating that they should be asked to set right a world that is so out of joint. Knowledge kills action. Action requires the veils of illusion. True knowledge, the insight into this horrible truth, outstrips any motive for action both in Hamlet and Dionysian man. In The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche continues, Conscious of the truth he has once seen, man now sees everywhere only the horror or absurdity of existence. Now he understands what is symbolic in Ophelia's fate. Now he understands the wisdom of the sylvan god Salinas. He is nauseated. The wisdom that the god Salinas possesses, which Nietzsche is referring to, is the truth of the absurdity of existence. In one play by Sophocles, the god Salinas tells King Midas that the best thing for man would be to not have been born at all, and the next best thing would be to die soon. In Nietzsche's thinking, the Greeks invented tragedy to overcome this very insight. They did so with tragedy and comedy. According to Nietzsche, in the worldview of the Greeks, tragedy and comedy are intertwined and coexistent. Comedies were intended to be played during the same religious festivals as tragedies. 
Comedy was necessary to create distance and perspective out of which the tragedy was to be understood. And this is the perspective from which Nietzsche seeks to understand the essence of Greek tragedy. When we view tragedy from the perspective of the comical, it takes on a whole new meaning for us. Consider again the truth which Salinas tells King Midas from this new perspective, as comical. In the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche references a scene from Sophocles' epic Oedipus at Colonus. There is an ancient story that King Midas hunted in the forest for a long time, the wise Salinas, the companion of Dionysus without capturing him. When Salinas at last fell into the king's hands, the king asked what was the best and most desirable of all things for man. Fixed and immovable, the demigod said not a word, till at last, urged by the king, he gave a shrill laugh and broke out into these words. O wretched ephemeral race, children of chance and misery, why do you compel me to tell you what it would be most expedient for you not to hear? What is best of all is utterly beyond your reach. Not to be born, not to be, to be nothing. But the second best thing for you is to die soon. In this scene, King Midas desperately chases a satyr, not understanding the meaning of his hunting. He searches for a truth he is not prepared to hear. The terrible truth which only Dionysus and Salinus can bear is accompanied by a shrill laugh. Salinus laughs because he knows more about men than men do. He laughs because he knows the secret of life's senselessness, and he knows this knowledge is necessary to overcome oneself. As Nietzsche writes in the Genealogy of Morality, A great tragedian, like every artist, arrives at the ultimate pinnacle of his greatness only when he comes to see himself and his art beneath him, when he knows how to laugh at himself. Just because Salinas can laugh at the folly of human beings, this does not mean he is immune to the truth he possesses. Just like the Dionysian man, he is painfully broken. He has looked into the terrors of individual existence, and knows that everything that comes into being must meet a sorrowful end. Nietzsche's perspective of tragedy is not pessimistic like Schopenhauer's was. Nietzsche believed tragedy should be viewed from the perspective of the comic and the experience of the absurd which holds the promise of overcoming one's own tragic fate. Nietzsche sees in the laughter of Salinas this very insight, which hints towards a possible overcoming of tragic fate, and carries with it a joyfulness in life that would otherwise be crippled by pessimism. Salinas's laughter hints at a secret source of eternal creativity. As the prophet and sage Zarathustra says, Not by wrath does one kill, but by laughter. Come, let us kill the spirit of gravity. According to Nietzsche, this unbearable truth which is expressed by Salinas is also the basis for understanding art. Nietzsche was not so much concerned with what art represents, but its function for life. Nietzsche sees art as the eternal force for creating new meaning and reinventing new forms. This is possible once we realize the true ground of reality as a formless Dionysian world of chaotic and senseless energies. This is what he meant when he said, the sublime and the comical are a step beyond the world of beautiful semblance. Laughter is indispensable because it provides the necessary distance which enables us to cope with the truth of our existence and to overcome it. In conveying his truth, Salinas laughs a shrill laughter and in doing so, he detaches himself from himself. This detachment is not a loss of sense, but an acceptance of the absurdity of life, and as Nietzsche points out, this also has the added benefit of a release from the disgust at absurdity. I no longer feel as you do. This cloud which I see beneath me, this blackness and gravity at which I laugh, this is your thunder cloud. Laughter is a special way of dealing with the total lack of sense and permanent contradiction in the world. The Greeks are known as a cheerful people, and this cheerfulness was not from a lack of profundity or pain, but was a result of this very insight, the acceptance and overcoming of it. Those Greeks were superficial, out of profundity. Laughter is the key to understanding the wisdom of Greek tragedy according to Nietzsche. 
In contrast to Schopenhauer, Nietzsche wants to teach us that the truth which tragedy expresses does not inevitably lead to a pessimistic view of life and a negation of the will. This insight is an undercurrent through all of Nietzsche's philosophy, and it is critical for understanding his philosophy. In several passages throughout Nietzsche's works, he encourages us to learn to laugh. You ought to learn the art of this worldly comfort first. You ought to learn to laugh, my young friends, if you are hell-bent on remaining pessimists. Or to say it in the language of that Dionysian monster who bears the name of Zarathustra. This crown of the laugher, the rose wreath crown, to you, my brothers, I throw this crown. Laughter I have pronounced holy. You higher men, learn to laugh. When Zarathustra encourages us to learn to laugh, he wants us to learn to overcome ourselves, and to overcome all of our pessimistic and nihilistic truths. For Zarathustra, laughter symbolizes the act of self-overcoming, and is a characteristic feature of the Ubermensch and Zarathustra himself. When Zarathustra says to learn to laugh, he also means we should learn to laugh properly. Zarathustra's laughter is not an ignorant or despising laughter. Laughter is a sign of height and lightness, even gloat, but in a good conscience. There is a big difference between a dumb, immediate, and unconscious laughter and a conscious, purposeful laughter. A divine laughter that can be attained only after learning how to take life at a certain distance, and as a means to knowledge. You look up when you feel the need for elevation, and I look down because I am elevated. Who among you can laugh and be elevated at the same time? Whoever climbs the highest mountains laughs at all tragic plays and tragic seriousness. Comedy and laughter are central to Nietzsche's task of overcoming the pessimism of Schopenhauer, which he thought would lead us away from life into a nihilistic oblivion. Laughter is the antidote to all pessimistic views of life. Only after we have learned to laugh can we learn to appreciate appearances and bear witness to the wonder and folly of human beings with a joyful and trusting fatalism. Nietzsche's yes saying was more than a tool to combat pessimism. Comedy and laughter are found in Nietzsche's philosophy as an ethic that says yes to life, expressed in the maxim Amor Fati, which means love of fate. Nietzsche's example shows that laughter is an authentic response to affirming a world of becoming. Nietzsche's use of comedy and laughter is a herald that resounds with a call urging us to recognize the humble yet noble earthbound beings that we are, and do not take ourselves too seriously. Nietzsche deals with many serious issues in his philosophy, like the death of God, nihilism, the sickness of Western civilization, the will to power, and the eternal recurrence. Laughter is offered as a way to bear these truths, and is supposed to assist us in overcoming our human, all too human condition. Now I am light. Now I fly, now I see myself beneath myself, now a god dances through me, 